Welcome back to another episode of the podcast, Ramiumdum Ruminations. My name is Scott, and I'm the host. Today's very special episode is called Safeguarding Children in the UK with Jane Christie from 21st Century Saints. Welcome back to the podcast, Ramiumptum Ruminations. I have got a very special guest in the green room who I'll bring out in just a minute. She is the host of 21st Century Saints. They had a fantastic announcement that they came out with just a couple of days ago when we're doing this recording, which is June 7th. We'll have her talk about that. So without further ado, Jane Christie, welcome to Ramiumptum Ruminations. Hey, thank you. It's great to be here. I love listening to you talk. You have one of those voices that is just so enjoyable to listen to. I'm glad to bring you on the show. Yes, says the man who should be reading bedtime stories to like, <laughs> like just soothes the ears as it goes down. So um, like uh, quite a few people, because we've been doing some uh, shows, more shows over in America recently, um, struggle to understand the accent. So if you need me to slow down or just have extra time to tune in, I am good with that. <laughs> I'm used to it. I understand you just fine. So don't, don't sweat it on my account. And the listeners can just, you know, press that jump back 15 seconds button if they need to catch something that. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of bedtime stories, I do read and make up bedtime stories for my kids every night. So at least there's somebody that's getting that, you know, enjoyment of my voice reading bedtime stories. <laughs> oh, honestly, if, I mean, we were, we were talking about this with my co-hosts the other night. If we make the mistake of listening to you anytime after 9 p.m., it's, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea what, how that ended. I've never listened to, heard the end of, of, of this particular episode yet. So, <laughs> no, we love it. We, we, we're big fans. We're big fans. Well, I appreciate that. Let's tell the audience what's this big announcement or this big thing in case they've been under a rock or maybe they're not tuned into what the 21st Century Saints are are up to these days. What's this big thing that, that happened for you guys? Okay, so we typically podcast about the lived experience of Mormonism here in the UK because things get very Utah centered. So this announcement has kind of, um, it, it's pretty historic. We have been asking since last August for the church to do safeguarding in a more robust way. Um, there is this illusion of safeguarding at the moment. Even the term safeguarding isn't something that had sort of been in the milieu till uh, my co-host Sarah started using it because professionally, People know what safeguarding is. Parents whose kids are at school, I mean, it, it's just a thing people assume happens. When you're at church and there is, um, you know, a, a policy of having two leaders in a room, which is still fairly new, uh, when there are policies where uh, leaders should watch a training video within a month of being called, all of these things... Um, which have huge problems, give us this illusion that everyone should feel safe at church. If I feel safe at church, well, then everyone does too. And look at all of these things that we have that support that. So we had highlighted holes in the system that people have been trying to highlight for a really long time. This is not news to anyone who knows even a little bit about child protection. You wouldn't send your child to a school um, that, that operated in the same way as church. Without diving too deep, what are some of these holes that you were pointing out to the LDS church? So we're pointing out that the training itself is a cartoon which minimizes the subject of safeguarding, doesn't treat it, you know, carefully enough, offers no opportunity to ask questions or for you to identify your own personal biases and blind spots, um, suggesting helpful things like uh, 
you know, uh, be aware of how this could be construed, um, you know, that type of thing. It's super fast. I mean, I think the record I've seen for it being done is within six minutes, although it should last around 30 minutes. Wow. Um, 30 minutes is if you click the wrong answers and have to keep going <laughs> back through. <laughs> oh, no. um, yeah. So, but, you know, it exists. So there's a positive. Um, <laughs> I suppose it's just not very good. Um, what other holes? Bishop interviews. Uh, the fact that at church we hear about modesty and chastity with context that can be extremely problematic. Uh, sleepovers that we assume that because our, you know, our kids' friend and their family, they're also members of the church, we, we just feel really safe there. Um, we, we often centre safeguarding um, in terms of children, but it's about so much more than that. Um, we have, you know, so many people with extra um, physical care needs, mental health needs, people with disabilities. Um, the LGBTQ community are defined by the United Nations as a vulnerable group, um, as well as people from traveling communities, people of African-American descent. But as we think commonly in our wards, we have an aging church population how often um you know do something as simple as tithing settlement um conversations with elderly people about their finances and the vulnerabilities that they may have around that um you know we're, we're a church who encourages people to do more so um are they are you know what are those conversations looking like could a person feel that there is any control or coercion when someone who has authority is talking to you about this. Um, parents who willingly sell their homes and um, spend their life savings serving missions, all of those things need to be considered in a context of safeguarding. Even when you know things are, are really benign, there are so many opportunities for someone to exploit another person. Um, simply looking at it, there's a dynamic of power and authority that plays out in a really uniquely Mormon way. So what's this big news then? So here are, here are all these things that you're highlighting. You're letting the church know. You've done some petitions. I think I even signed off on one or put my, you know, Remy Empton Ruminations logo on something for you. So what's, what's the big news? Well, with... The work that we did, uh, we they set up a safeguarding community uh, committee uh, to look at safeguarding, uh, which was huge. That had never happened before. Um, we got word that they were going to church leaders were going to pilot a program where they're going to pilot safeguarding, and they were going to look at it initially as we'll pilot it in London. Um, so the announcement begins with there is no pilot. Uh, they're going to roll out safeguarding throughout the UK. Background checks, which here we call them DBS checks or PVG checks in Scotland, will be happening as of the 1st of July for people working with children and youth. Stake safeguarding specialists are going to be called. Um, those should be in place by the end of August and safeguarding should be fully implemented by the end of the year. So that was the announcement, um, which was unheard of to, uh, <laughs> for us to, to get to that point. People have been asking for this for years. And part of what has made it so unique is not just the fact that activism made something happen. I think what has been different about this is the fact that we've had post-Mormons um, angry ex-Mormons, <laughs> podcasters. Um, hey, not all of us are angry. No, me either. I'm only angry sometimes. <laughs> only on Tuesdays when I haven't had my nap. Um, yeah, like, you know, uh, but yeah, angry ex-Mormons, people who would happily see the church burn down, um, as well as church leaders, lawyers. Everyone has been in agreement about this subject. Um, when we all sort of, you know, that Book of Mormon um, 
that Book of Mormon moment where the people speak with one voice. That's kind of what happened here. And there was a little bit of concern. There was a lot of concern <laughs> about who, um, you know, we, we were sort of associating with these people who have signed the open letter, like, like, Scott from Rami Umpton Ruminations. That's right. We have names like <laughs> we have names like Bill Real and Radio Free Mormon and Lindsay Hansen Park and Natasha Helfer, people who have been excommunicated. Um, and that made them nervous. Um, but what it did was because we did this in a way that was um both challenging to them, we really annoyed the hell out of them. <laughs> we sent <laughs> We sent letters. Sounds like righteous fury. No, honestly, it was it was um <laughs> it was such a shame. We sent letters to every bishop in the United Kingdom to oh, wow. tell them here is what um the rules are, what the, the law is around safeguarding, and you need to be aware that if you call someone knowingly to a position where they can be working with um with with vulnerable groups uh, you could go to jail <laughs> like, do you know that? and no one's telling the bishops about you know the, their liability here uh, so yeah we we thought let's let's do that and uh, it was really appreciated the information was fascinating although it did not go down well <laughs> with leaders um there's a clear chain of authority where everything is top down and coming from outside of the chain authority and also coming from a woman that's clearly against the typical pattern within the LDS church. Yeah, it was it was making them very nervous who we were hanging around with, <laughs> what our <laughs> motivations were. And the reality is we have got great relationships with people throughout the church and church leadership even where they've been a bit nervous um we we're truthful and we're honest. We make sure that they know that we love them, that we're supporting what they're doing. We make it really clear that if the church is doing something good, we wanna we, we will tell the world about it. We will be really so here I am telling the world. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> we'll be like, I I make it really clear that um the lead legal counsel for the area is extremely hot in the manner of Dieter F. Uchtdorf. He has that little silver fox thing going on. So yeah, I use all methods of flattery and <laughs> just general kindness. But no, we we have fun. We have we have I I believe a really good relationship. And I think that that level of trust that at times they've sort of been a bit worried about has allowed them to amplify the voices of the people who sit on the committee, the people who um, are state presidents who have been trying to sort of say, look, we've got concerns around this for a really long time. We were the people who stuck our head above the parapet with that real threat of, yeah, they could excommunicate us. Um, but yeah, for the first time, People have, you know, changes happened without an excommunication happening first. And the really cool part, and I suppose this is the last part of the announcement that is just uh, delightful, is that my co-host Sarah has been called as safeguarding specialist in her stake, the first um, safeguarding specialist in the UK. She has already, she's been called and sustained. She's already begun her work in that that calling. Um, and yeah. That's amazing. It is huge, yeah. So we're 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 very excited, um, and we're really proud. And it's it's important to us to I think acknowledge. You know, we we work with this broader, uh, the, the Brit Avengers. I mean, it is such a cheesy title. It just it. It, it stuck. Um, but it this, works. This it's little great. Group of, yeah, I mean, everyone knows it now. So um, this little group who. Um, you know, we have excommunicated podcasters. We've got the, the you know, the, the really super edgy one. Um, we, we have priesthood dispatches says things that give me a nosebleed. Um, and he is. <laughs> he I'm is, laughing because it's true. <laughs> it is so true. A delight to my soul. Um, but, you know, the, the reality is. It's been his story. Um, he's talked about his survivor experiences. And how traumatic they were. It's his story um, 
that was part of the voices that we're carrying forward. And Nemo the Mormon uh, practically served as our secretary for the whole month of um, January, um, getting all of this information for us. And, um, you know, so yeah. And just also to stress that one of the anxieties, I guess, was caused around us writing to the bishops. How did how did you get our, our addresses? And it's really simple. Uh, church meeting house locator on LDS tools gives you them all. Oh, <laughs> <So> wow. <laughs> some, some bishops have um, an arrangement where, so, so here wards are not used as much at all. In fact, they sit with um, iron gates. Uh, they get used on a Sunday for a couple of hours. So no one's there to pick up mail. Um, so there's a mail redirect in place. So I think whenever um, they started landing on the homes, uh, the doorstep of the homes of bishops, um, and particularly we were hearing bishops' wives were, were like, one, how did they get our address? And two, you could go to jail. Um, do, what the hell? Yeah, <laughs> so, wow, that's big. Yeah, we we made people nervous, but in a good way. <laughs> the the steps that you took was it just those letters, or what was the next step after the after these letters that you sent out to all the bishops? We we began really in August, formally asking and emailing. So almost a year ago now, right? This this isn't even a full year. It's crazy. Um, yeah, we, we began formally asking. We then started working with um, charities, solicitors, lawyers, church leaders, um, organizations who do sort of specialize in child protection, other faiths. Um, what's the other really important one? Um, oh, yeah, uh, legal representatives. Um, all, all of those groups. So we're having conversations with lots of people who were just really keen to help. No one's making any judgment calls. No one's like, oh, no, that sounds kind of culty. You know, everything was, um, no, we were the only people who said that. <laughs> we were just, you know, we were like, yeah, we just, we we need support. And, and even now, this goal that, you know, this announcement, this is just, this has to be the start. We can't have that illusion of safeguarding, keeping it happening. So people really want to support the church to be its best. But the church obviously gets nervous around that. So us trying to open up the door for those conversations was the was the work of several months. Um, we were then asked to present at a national conference on the subject of child abuse and we were asked to speak about our work. So we wanted to let the church know um, we're going to be talking about you guys, um, and just just so you know, here's here's where we're at. Um, and they they were fantastic. They, they've they've just they've always been really good. Like I say, a little bit like, what are your motivations here? But but they're just you know we we we're we're Mormon. We can't ask these questions directly, right? Like, do you hate the church? Do you re- do you really want to just bring this down? And like, no, we're just. Like, you know, we're all just doing our job. Well, if you're centering it around the protection of children, that has nothing to do with doctrine or any of the philosophy with the church. You would think that would be super obvious. Yeah, you, <laughs> you would think so. So, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so so we we then... Did the did the presentation did the, did the national presentation, which was was really 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 fun and uh, fascinating. Lots of people were interested. So yeah, lots of people are now looking at what we're doing. The church is super aware of that. Um, we we are the work we're also doing. Uh, uh, we we were being asked a lot about prevalence, and you know, there's not a whole lot of statistical information out there. So we had. Um, invited victims to come forward to speak about their experience, um, self-reporting, whatever that would look like. We would also um, just sort of reach out anyone who wanted to just have a chat with us about their opinions. So if you are, I don't know, super, even super TBM, when have you felt safe at church? What did that look like for you? Um, uh, you know, and what what have you sort of witnessed where, you know, things maybe could have been better or, you know, so, so that it's really balanced questions we've sort of tried to ask. Um, 
with, with lots of opportunity for you just to tell your story. Um, so we did that. We Lots of people spoke with us. We then, to make sure that people could feel um, that they could speak to us confidentially, just to add another level of convenience for reporting, we launched a survey um, which is just really brief. So we got we got so much information back from that. We've spoken with, um, I, I mean, we've looked at over a hundred cases. We've spoken with over a hundred people, um, and so from that, we're we're letting the church know. Look, we've got information that we think you'll find helpful, um, but also for us in in shaping our work and how we need to keep either reframing or reapproaching or just analysing what we're going to do next or what will the next steps look like. Um, there was, in one particular question, we asked people, if you experienced what you would term as abuse in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in a church context, did you feel supported by your church community? And only one person has said yes. Everyone else uh, had sort of like, overwhelmingly no, most people just sort of somewhat, which was interesting, hugely interesting. But when it came to, did you feel supported by your church leader? To this moment, the survey is still open, to this moment, no, no one, not one person has said that they felt supported. Now that is indicative of um, systemic problems which we know exist um but yeah so we were able to take this information and present on it and um amplify the voices of victims uh people who are saying that the church asked uh, my family to choose between me or the church and they chose the church uh people who've been ostracized people who are saying uh you know that this this bishop abused me um this uh my I experienced domestic violence and he got to carry on like nothing happened. Um, no one believed me. People also who were asking for justice, who felt that the church wasn't about justice, they were never going to get it. Um, really, really powerful, powerful views. Um, so yeah, we then heard it and it's around about this point. Um, we, we we launch um an, an open letter, we launch a petition, um, and we we sent the letters to all of the bishops. It was around about this point that we um we were told the church is setting up a safeguarding committee, which has never happened before. That would that was a first. And I was furious. I'm like a freaking committee to discuss to before you will even recommend anything, you have to have a awesome. Well, let's park this for a couple of years and put our feet up. I was, I mean, I know that in Mormon terms, oh my goodness, you got a committee? Yeah. <laughs> That's huge. <laughs> um, but they were working so hard. They, they were, they were um, I mean, several times a week and they knocked it out of the park. They, they clearly um, are, are good people who <laughs> we offered suggested Sarah would be a fantastic addition to this co this committee my my co-host um that they, they just didn't didn't get back about that so um yeah invitation still open but what they would do what and not not just you know the committee or people around the committee people um will constantly contact um contact us especially Sarah just cuz confidentiality is everything or we would have no credibility in this space um We'll ask Sarah, I've got a situation, what what do you think? And uh, it, it, she she's doing that so often. Now there's a church helpline, which we've got other concerns about, but um one problem at a time, I guess. <laughs> right. Sarah uh, has such a le like such a level of expertise. She has not just worked with them um, with offenders, she's you know, in, in, in this this area. She's, you know, been a been a social worker for a lengthy amount of time. She has helped shape policy. She knows the language around it. I mean, she she's just a, a powerhouse of a of a woman. She's retired, and um, I don't know what the hell she's thinking because she's working on this harder than she ever did before, and now she doesn't get paid. Um, but yeah, so 
you know, we, we're having these really interesting conversations. We're trying to feed back information. The committee are still listening. I mean, all, we, we're providing recommendations. Um, and so, yeah, that's what that's what brought us up to the announcement. And like I say, what has just been so unique are all of these dissident, ex-Mormons, people who are TBM, but it's also been at every level of the church. So it's been it's been leadership. It's been you know at members who have left, members who are still active, um, people who just have had an interest. And I think that's what's been so unique, unique that everybody's been able to push together. Why do you think your efforts to pressure the church or to do activism in these areas? Why do you think it's worked for you? where it hasn't worked in any other instance that it seems to have been tried within the church. And we could, we could list off countless examples. You know, we could talk about, you know, the list would be extensive. And so I'll, I'll just say most people that have done any activism against the church or even for the church to try and get a good positive change. And they're still a believer. They usually get excommunicated. Why haven't you been excommunicated? I do, if you find out, let me know. <laughs> um, no, I, I think, because let's face it, we, this was what we, this is the, the space that we live in, this constant, oh, is this the thing that's going to, is this the thing that's going to do it? Um, <laughs> we, I can relate. <laughs> we plan our next week. Yeah, once a week, you're like, well, <laughs> will it be a party? It could be this one. <laughs> it, could, it could be. <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, I and I think it's it's fairly healthy for us to do that because um, we come up against the fact that it's so frustrating that there are leaders who could make these decisions very easily. This could have happened years ago. People, I, I am not the first person who's asked these questions, nor has Sarah had her whole professional life doing this. Um, why, why the hell haven't you listened? And it, we, we keep on thinking someone higher up the chain is going to do something. Or that, and I think this is what we see as super common with the people we work with right now, people can feel like they are able to make a difference in the space that they're in right now. And they don't want to risk that. Um, so they can put their head above the parapet in a in a in a safe way, which is a lot for for what they're doing, and it both drives me absolutely crazy. Um, but also, we, this wouldn't have happened without those people who are maybe like, yeah, you know what, they're driving me crazy too. But you know, on on this, maybe maybe we could talk about this. I think it's allowed them to feel safe in having the discussion. Um, I also think part of it is because we are prepared for um anything that could follow in terms of consequences that's just what you know that's just where we stand but also um that we I feel like we do it in a safe enough way so we will push you but you know that it's it's from love we, we're not I think people just wait for the angry women to get started and then you just stop listening and then, <laughs> y you know. Um, yeah, oh yeah. So at, at times, I'll use the primary voice. At, at times, I will make sure that, you know, this is a meeting where you want to feel really safe. You want to make sure that we feel really safe. I understand that and we have an understanding of the language we need to use around that so let's let's start with a prayer and let's make sure that um that that your needs are being heard too because this is really uncomfortable for you and i know that um and and i think because it hasn't just been one person so far i think because we've had this combination of expertise of platform of the time being right um you know, with all of these cases coming up, um, I think it can look like people are actually really worried about it, but they just haven't been able to say it out loud so far. So yeah, I think there's a few things, but for me, it really is people at all levels, at different places of engagement, my husband's a non-member, at different places of um interest in the church whether you want to see it all burned down or not everyone with one voice is, is saying this is what we expect um 
And I think we've made it exciting because the other thing is that um, we sort of made this really clear as we were presenting to um, to our leadership audience uh, ahead of the conference that we did. The church can, if it wants to do innovation and do it really, really well, if a policy is, is um, if a policy was announced at midnight tonight, there are legions of Mormons who are implementing it. I, immediately by the next day it's this is now what's happening um and we'll embrace it um mormons aren't suspicious of new policies we we te- because we already start to say oh you know it's kind of always happened it's always looked like this so the the changes changes we're a good audience for that if it's done correctly um so if the church decided we're going to do this and we're going to make it the best it can possibly be. And that will mean that this policy currently isn't sufficient. That will mean we are continually looking and we're continually reviewing it, knowing that DBS checks need to extend to all vulnerable groups, not just the children that you're working with, um, knowing that the safeguarding leads are going to have to feed back areas of concern you're going to see a lot of teething problems and we're going to have to continually keep feeding that. That's going to mean listening to women. That's going to mean listening to victims because no victim has been involved directly in shaping this policy, which is key to good safeguarding. If you can start doing all of those things, then the church potentially could be a world leader in safeguarding. You have the ability to do that. And I think presenting that is sort of this really exciting idea. And it means that you can't start from, well, we're already doing world-class safeguarding, <laughs> like, which is what the party line had been, right? Um, but when we highlight these things, we're like, well, you know what, people, we would love to be able to point here and say, look where it's working. Um, so yeah, yeah, to, I, I think we we are able to do that but also um you know the the victims that we've worked with we had let them know ahead of this announcement um because of course it's going to be painful uh, you know also for so many who are going to feel like this is far too little far too late it's not enough and um they're all completely correct um however we're going to get to keep on amplifying your voice uh, who are these are people who are saying to us, you know, the first person who said to us when when we had told them, and we have kept hearing it consistently since, um, you won't take your foot off the gas now, will you? And we're like, no, of course we won't. Of course we won't. We're going to be in this space. We're going to keep working in this space. And we're going to keep talking about the tough stuff. I am floored. I think you guys are doing excellent work. And, and I'm just excited to see what else comes out of, of what you guys are working on. Well, thank you for being part of that because, you know, like I say, when when we asked if you would, would you help co-sign the open letter? And yeah, that's it, it's a it's a been a no brainer for everyone, and that's what's let us get to this space. So, thank you. Part of me, you know, across the pond trying to help out is getting the word out to my audience as well. And with that, what I want to ask you, and maybe we'll direct this to listeners that aren't over in the UK, but what advice would you give to a nuanced believer like yourself that's living in the United States that maybe sees some of these exact same issues? How can they go about kicking off that sort of a change like you guys have seen over there? Well, I I, I think... So people are, are already asking us this question. And I suppose my answer is something that I had overlooked (laughs) before. Um, One of the things that we are really seeking for the church to do is to not have to deal with everything in-house. That when you do these DBS checks, when safeguarding training is happening, there are expert agencies who work in this area who are desperate to work with you and share their knowledge and not judge you. Um, There are organisations who will do this for you and with you and we'll keep everything confidential. Um, So we've really tried to encourage the church itself and that's also what's lacking in this statement. We need you to work with other people. And so, yeah, that, that would be, I think, the first thing I would say for people who are wondering if this could happen for them too about whatever it is 
that is important to you. Um, build relationships. Um, not being worried when someone expresses their agreement in a different way or when you bump up against people is, you know, if if you have this common ground, build relationships and somehow that seems to be key. Um, we don't need to... <sighs> Even, you know, even protesting is such an important thing that, that we've never really got to do here because we're all so, you know, spread out. But yet showing up at the protest, being visible, letting people know that this is something that is an issue. As as those conversations start to happen, people start to feel safe. And that's how we we got started. It was simply by having the conversation. Um, What tends to happen when you start talking about specifically abuse because you know that this isn't we don't just do this one thing our podcast is about talking about lots of different lived experience of mormonism things so much of the time it comes back to talking about abuse because when you start talking about it people start disclosing so i think it's remembering also that what you have been taught your whole life about authority and what's possible and what's allowed you you can break the rules I mean, it's it's and it's not always going to be received well, and you need to be prepared for the fact that people may try to put you in your place. And so what? I mean, so what? <laughs> what like what are they going to do? Are they going to take you into the bishop's office and make you write out the book of Enos ten times, and then that's your punishment? I mean. What really are they gonna do? So yeah, um, I think be bold, be brave, talk to people. Um, obviously, we have learned we're always prepared to help and advise. So if there's anything that we can do, um, you know, as Brit Avengers or as a podcast, but the world is definitely ready for this. We've seen, um, we've seen that the church is anxious about people raising their voices and speaking out. Ahmed Corbett's talk last year which was horrific about how just how awful this is <laughs> to, to do any kind of activism well actually you know th things are always changing in the church and I think when we can see that and see the power in that just just remembering that you're super powerful like what what you can do we talk I mean you're you're part of this generation where we were teaching that one young woman could change the world well, you've raised up people who are taking that seriously. So, yeah. So let's switch gears here a little bit. I want to talk about your podcast and then ask you some questions about your personal belief, if that's not off the table. Absolutely. 21st Century Saints. I've listened to you off and on over the last couple of years. You um, have changed recently hosts. It was you and Alana for a time and... She stepped away is what it sounds like, or am I mistaken? Oh my good. No, see, I really wish that I would, because right, I am so dramatic. It's my <laughs> thing. Um, yeah, I, I really should have been born a drag queen. Um, I, so I would have loved to have some big on air fight where it's like, yeah, I'm out of here. Well, close the door behind <laughs> you. Um, yeah, no, it, it's just, it's been so good and so healthy so that whenever people ask, it's such a healthy answer <laughs> that, um, yeah. So Alana, who's the reason why I started podcasting, all my friends have left the church and, uh, whereas before I could welcome into this, Hey, this is a new on space. It's so great to have you here. The water's lovely. I've got someone to talk to at freaking last. <laughs> Because it's just been me biting my tongue this whole time. And uh, and they leave. <laughs> oh, thanks. Okay, bye. Um, and so, yeah, Alana was really hanging in there. Um, the abuse is um, close to Alana's heart. She's a survivor. Um, and when all of the Protect the Children stuff was happening, I remember her. And she was... She's never been TBM, but she's um, you know she, she's edgy, she's cool, but but her values were were very sort of orth orthodox and had been what she'd been taught. And 
I'm seeing all of this stuff coming out and thinking if if she reads this without any kind of heads up or warning, without a trigger warning, um, I'm going to prepare her a little bit for this. So yeah, that's where those conversations are kind of where we started. Everyone talks in the foyer. Everyone talks um, after we get out and we're detoxing from church. Um, <laughs> we're having... Were you in the same ward or are you in the same ward? Yes. We we live like four streets away from each other. Yeah. I, I, I could throw my slipper at her and it would uh hit her on the ass. <laughs> so yeah, no, we're we're very we're very, very close. She's she is my best friend. Um and, and we would have really cool, edgy conversations that would just horrify <laughs> horrify people. But hey, um yeah, we're we're we are women, and we were speaking as grown up women <laughs> underneath a picture of the savior and and the the church for you. But <laughs> anyway, and so yeah, <laughs> my my deconstruction had we had four year conversations as part of my deconstruction too. There was a group of us that we stopped going to elders quorum, and we would just sit as a group, and we would have like really deep conversations about depression and you know living up to all the standards of the church and like you know we were kind of all deconstructing together in these like we we called it our foyer church or our foyer whatever so we uh anyway so when you're talking about getting together in the foyer that's that's uh close to my heart because i did the same thing as well what would tend to happen is people would start off in a class and then would either something so wildly that crap crazy would happen that you would have to go out to laugh for a little bit and then you're chatting with the other people who just couldn't go in in the first place um or whatever yeah hallway church is just amazing (laughs) um (laughs) so yeah uh so so we started a podcast because i'm thinking if we can have the conversations that we are having that we wish we could have in the like why aren't they happening like five feet away in that classroom? Because they could. And and I get that you want to feel safe at church. You want to feel like comfort to, to to be, you know, all week you're thinking about stuff. There's all this messaging. I just want to come and just sit in the space at the feet of Jesus. I get you, right? But also there are some things going on that we need to talk about. So I, you know, I I see a place for both. Um, so yeah, the, the podcast was to talk about how we are living and experiencing Mormonism and what are those barriers to you being able to come unto Christ? What are those barriers that um that or 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 messaging that you're being told that isn't sitting right with you? Or what are the, what are the wonderful things where you really are gaining strength? Um, where in church we can go as far as you know, those basic testimony questions, the read, ponder, pray. What are you going to do when it counts? So, you know, like I, I've done episodes where, um, <laughs> not many, but, you know, back when um, t- when we started the podcast, I literally had said to Alana, hey, I'm thinking about doing a podcast. Um, and about a week later, I'm like, okay, we're ready to go live in five minutes. Can you get ready? And, you know, she, and she's so brilliant. She's like, I was, okay. And um, yeah, so so sometimes we're talking about really vulnerable stuff. Sometimes we're talking about swe- swearing, uh, Mormon language, which cracked me up. Um, we would invite guests on. We've had John Dillon on, Bill Reel on, we've had you on. Um, but then there would be episodes where, so I, I'm a mother of a disabled child. We have, um, so my youngest kid, is um, someone, so a family member who now lives with us as our child permanently. We we now we, we are now proud proud additional parent. We, we unlocked a bonus child. Nice zero. <laughs> I know, right? I, exactly. Um, you know, we, we've got an army kid and um, and just this fifteen year old giant, uh, you know, six foot nine year old kid who doesn't even fit in the house. Um, so yeah, we have all of this stuff going on. Um, and my husband's not a member of the church and uh, as like, I would struggle with some things around inclusivity in church and just being able to be at church. And I, now I, I, my kids can't leave the house. There's no one else to look after him. So for such a long time, I'm like, church is just going to move on without me. They're, 
you're going to and yeah that's that's what happened so I get to church when I can get to church now every week I plan to get to church and every week the year is some massive trauma in my kid's life and it's I mean it's it's really really hard work and it sucks and I resent it that I feel like my spiritual uh, you know my, my ability to connect spiritually has been almost taken away from me um and I'm like, where, where did you all go? Did 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 you? And I didn't anticipate it. When you say where did you all go, are you talking about like friends at the church that you're not touching base with? Or? Well, see, kind of yes, because yeah. I just want to make sure I understood you. Yeah, well, because it's it's this is the thing with me. Everything is so messy and complicated, and nothing. <laughs> it's like yeah, it's a little bit this and a little bit that. Um, yeah, friends who you know, you've buggered off and left Mormonism. You've headed into the sunset. You're happy and that's awesome. And we're still friends, but you know, there, there isn't that spiritual connected community that I once had. So that plus just what ministering looked like, uh, what being able to be part of community worship looked like. So, I mean, I would literally have to go online to worship with other churches or at, like five houses away from me is our local Catholic church. I'm having to go there um, and get really creative about anyway. I mean, that that's the sort of digression for later, I guess. But yeah, I, I would do episodes where I'm like, I feel so alone. My child has no place in church and this really sucks. And I get home and I have to lie to him and tell him that people were all asking how is Ronan doing and I have to tell them what their names are because he cares and he misses them and they're not even thinking of them and and I would just be sort of like in this place of mourning and grief I'm like yeah I'm just I'm just going to do a podcast where I'm just feeling really crappy for half an hour but let's talk about that um so yeah we we get messy and vulnerable and cheeky and <laughs> it's always enjoyable to listen yeah. to <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. You've got two new hosts with you as well. When did you bring them on? Yes. So Sarah was last year. So as, as Alana has now, she's fully transitioned out of church, living her best life, as engaged. Good as, for her. Right? She graduated. Um, and screw you for leaving me. No, I mean, we're still best <laughs> friends. So, you know, I'm like, you, you left me alone. Um, so yeah, she, she's doing her thing and it's fantastic. Um, Sarah has been working like on and off with us for, for about a year, but sort of more fully um, involved in the podcasting side of things towards sort of the end of last year. And I mean, Sarah's... Oh my goodness. So Sarah's just one of my closest, dearest, best friends. She, I mean, she's a retired grandmother and she is so funny. She is just so edgy. She, I mean, she, she just ticks all the boxes of a wonderful human being. Um, so, and we have a good dynamic, um, I feel like as, as friends. Then we most recently proposed a podcast relationship marriage. So my my second podcast wife is Ruth. Um, <laughs> so Ruth is um, the sister-in-law of one of the Brit Vengers. So uh, Julian Heath, who used to do Sunstone. So we, we were friends and uh, she would like go on to do Nemo's halftime show and things. And she's just so freaking smart she's like the queen of analogies and she really knows what she's talking about her insights are amazing um and she can really speak to the crapness uh she often she'll feel like uh she doesn't want to sound like she's been a downer or i don't want to burst your bubble or i don't want to be disrespectful and it's like no you're you're being perfect because this is this is the wonderful space we live in this is what our friendship looks like um as I have really felt like a, like spiritual needs not being met, the people who have met those needs have been not like my podcast uh, friends and the Brit Vengers and 
more than the um, Mormon community, the TBM community, or even the progressive community. Overwhelmingly, the people who have supported me and my faith and spirituality have been ex-Mormons because they know how much is involved. They know what that heart looks like. And uh, they, they're just so happy just to just to sit in, in a space and be supportive. So I, yeah, the, the whole community, as much as we, there's so much unhealthiness baked into where each of those stages or places, um, oh my goodness, what the, the goodness that's out there is incredible. I, I know you said you don't, you don't make it super often to your local congregation and that's fine. No judgment there. Do they know that you're Jane from 21st century saints? the the members yeah. in your ward they do <laughs> yeah they well i mean th- th- there'll be some who just don't really care very much we'd wondered about this for such a long time but i think it's gotten to the level where because what we're doing has an impact yeah oh so a significant one recently yeah uh, sometimes the impact is not so good so so, um, yeah, no. Here's the like the the honest stuff. Um, so we we do live shows, um, specifically one because I am so lazy and I editing is a skill that I just think congratulations to you for having that gift in your life and <laughs> no, that for, level of patience. For me, it's, I have to pause and collect my thoughts. And then I'm like, okay, that's exactly what I want to say. And then I keep going and I have to edit all that stuff out. So. Even that, how do you manage the U-turn of the thoughts? It was my thought. Now I changed my thought. Oh. Now, now what? <laughs> <laughs> so I do have ADHD and that is a real struggle. Um, my outlines uh, are not usually very long. It's like, read this passage and then talk about it. And that, that, that's kind of my outline usually. <laughs> I don't usually, yeah, anyway. So I, I it's, editing is a struggle, but uh, it's, it's part of my process. Have you ever done a really bad thing or said a really bad thing or something you really regret? Oh yeah. Yeah. And then just cut it right out. <laughs> <gasps> See? <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> There's been an episode, oh, this has been a while since, but there was an episode I recorded and I recorded it and edited it and I was, you know, scheduled it to publish and uh, I was, I was working and just like thinking about it. And I was like, you know what? I think I said something really stupid in that episode. And I went back through and I re-listened and I was like, yeah, I can't publish this. And so I had to tweak it and rephrase what I said. And anyway, it doesn't happen super often, but it does happen. Uh, Well... I I really wanted to be the person who I'm whatever I say I'm going to stand by my words even if I regret them later I will <laughs> I will take accountability and I will apologize so um no I mean this is this is I really feel bad about this but unfortunately that's not the kind of podcast I do and it is live and once it's out there it's out there so um we were talking with a survivor and we generally don't do survivor stories for a host of different reasons because it can be um we have a duty of care um and if someone wants to go there that's you know that we totally respect that but also there are a lot of really creepy people out there who will not necessarily hold your story not just in the respectful way that it needs to be but some people yeah let Let's just we can let it that hang one. there. Yeah, let's just do that. And um, so while you know the, the survivor is is so vulnerably sharing her story, um, there were moments while we would sort of take a bit of a beat, and you know just just have a bit of a sort of light hearted moment where we're we're sharing something. And and I remember, and I was telling a story about something that had happened now not a big deal but I effectively I named and shamed who I felt creepy hugger guy in our ward is well I didn't say his name but I gave enough identifying information now just for context (laughs) just for context when I say creepy hugger guy right I have OCD and generally I'm absolutely fine but when I'm ill I 
I, I literally want to claw my own skin off. And the thought of someone hugging me, I, I have been like, I'm going to climb up a wall to get away from. I mean, I've had some really uncomfortable encounters and, and it, it can upset people. Yeah. Yeah. And it's weird because most of the time you're totally fine and this mm-hmm. kind of comes out of nowhere. Um, but also uh, framing that in, in a Mormon context where it's, sometimes you're okay with having hugs from people and sometimes you just don't want to hug that person or <laughs> w- whatever it is, right? Um, they, w- we're not at hug level of friendship here. And so there can be this assumption, okay, we're going to, we're going to do, anyway, I am digressing into the whole point. (laughs) Sure. So people in your ward do know. I'm justifying myself. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Here's what I meant when I ruined someone's life. No. Um, So yeah, naturally the, it, it was identifying enough that it was obvious that it could be a couple of people. And It was just really frustrating because with hindsight, I would not have said that. Now, it was true. I don't like it. Maybe think about hugs and accountability and how that goes with children, especially who, you know, the assumption that you have to hug someone. So that's the broader conversation. So I I stand by totally what the point was I was trying to make, but oh, how clumsy of me to to do that. And, And yeah, you know, people were really hurt. And I really regret that. Um, I, so I don't love that. What, you know, it, it's just really unfortunate that, um, we haven't ever been able to have a conversation about that, but I don't know that that would be appropriate either. So there's that, um, that episode did eventually get taken down for different reasons. I wouldn't have taken it down just because I regretted saying something, but there, there was, yeah, there, there, there were a few things happening. <laughs> but, yeah, no. So yeah, they they know, and I think part of it is because they, there has been conversations about it that have been, you know, whenever it's it's kind of unfolding more as kind of gossip, like oh, you you know, like Jane said that thing, and it was about you, and you're like, well, you're sitting on the bishop, Rick. Did you really need to go and tell <laughs> tell the version? <laughs> like, way to go, ease tension there. Um, yeah, so I don't feel good about that, but it happened. And unfortunately, we're living Mormon lives and sometimes things get a bit close to home. Uh, yeah. When you do go to to your local congregation, how vocal are you about some of the things that you might not believe in? Or what, what is the decision process that goes through your mind when something comes up? Maybe it's not something you believe in, or maybe it's something that you maybe just lightly disagree with, whatever the, whatever the instance. How do you decide what to say and what not to say? I feel like we talked about this one time, like out, out with a podcast. I feel like we had that conversation um, before. But um, you know when for years you have always been that person who has to put their hand up and say, yeah, but also. (laughs) Yeah. Right? So there's the work of always having to do this. There's a tone that you have to be aware of because you want to make it really sure that you're not angry and upset and annoyed. And it's a teacher who's volunteering and they're doing their little best. And it's pretty crappy to derail a whole lesson because you're feeling in your feelings about whatever. So... A few things happen because I learned to have to weigh up how often I'm going to do it because it, it does take a toll. Um, and it's, it's, it's crap to always be that person, right? The I'm actually person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, hey, can I just say person? Yeah. Um, well, I remember it's really interesting to me that at one point, it had zero emotional cost whatsoever. It was quite, it was just quite factual. And someone in Sunday school was making a comment about false doctrine. You know, for example, um, for example, uh, wh- whatever thing it is, this is false doctrine, that's false doctrine. Feminism is false doctrine. And I remember my eyebrows shooting up and I'm sort of having a chuckle and I'm saying, well, as a feminist, can I just say that, um, you know, we, we, oh, I think he was talking about evolution, actually, that, uh, you know, it's, it's totally possible to be a member of the church 
and be all of those things because the thing that we do all agree on is we love the Lord <laughs> and just kind of like do it. So I, there's, because that's the other thing that makes it tired is always having to put the positive spin on it somehow, somewhere or end with positivity. Or offer grace for a position that's just callous and unfriendly. Yeah, right. Like you're you're being horrible to LGBTQ people, and we have to frame that in a really nice, supportive way. Yeah, it's that's hard, yeah. hard work right there. Um, yeah. So, uh no, I'm I'm pretty much still the person who'll sort of be like, yeah, but because otherwise you're not sitting in your integrity. I I don't do it as often as like, I, I don't know. I guess people think I'm doing it constantly it probably feels like I am um there certainly wouldn't be a Sunday that goes by that if something con you know with conflict would (laughs) yeah I would have to be that well because this is the thing all of my friends who these things that you're talking about are affecting have gone and I know that you're really happy with your answer but I'm really glad you're happy but they're not and so there's this part of things that I element of the conversation that you're not taking into account here and that's when I tend to speak up so you know especially when it's around race issues or gender issues or LGBTQ issues yeah well you made you made a comment earlier and this was maybe 15 20 minutes ago but you said that that the motive for most of the people going to the church um in your opinion is to just come and sit at the feet of of Jesus and learn and feel filled and the things that you're talking about are impediments you know for for your white hetero member of the church they're going to go and they're going to check all the boxes and nothing that's said is going to uh, be a barrier from for them to actually feel spiritually filled so the things that you're talking about and hitting on right here are all the barriers for other people in these marginalized communities that prevent them from sitting through a sunday school meet lesson or you know a talk you know, during sacrament meeting, these are the things that prevent them from actually feeling spiritually fulfilled. Right. But thanks so much for coming on. I I think this was a fascinating chat. The subjects I think we covered are are very important for listeners around the world. A lot of these issues that we're talking about, the mm-hmm. activism that needs to happen, are are these exact barriers that I just mentioned. You know, the, the reason that you stand up and and do all of this activism for safeguarding children is because you see a problem. You see something that's preventing people from going to church and feeling spiritually fulfilled. You want children to be able to go to church and be safe. That should be a safe place for them. And I, I see this, this fascinating parallel between you know what I just said and then what you have been doing for the last year. And, and I just wish that more people could, could capture this momentum that you and the 21st century sayings, the Brit Vengers have been going on. And, and I want to get that message out to as many people as possible. So maybe to wrap this up, do you have any final remarks, any, any last advice or anything you want to say to, um, to, to my audience? Yeah, I, I guess the, the final thing would be about the things that kind of give me hope. Um, the, the reason why it's, I was going, I was going to say worth staying in this space. Um, but how things look on Tuesday are completely different from how they look on Wednesday. So I, you know, I always reserve the right to be, I I have no idea what this is going to look like for me. Um, but I guess it would be around having, you know, recognizing that there are real barriers to us being able to be safe at church, be us at church. So when we hear these constant statements of certainty, it can be enough to make us feel like there is something so deeply wrong that this is not what Mormonism looked like. Um, I, I can't get behind that. So here is not, it's not right. It's, it makes it not true. And I mean, you know what? Maybe it does make it not true. Maybe it does. And I absolutely honor that. When we're having discussions about that become centered around you, you know the road that often Sunday school or priesthood relief society will go down these certainty statements that 
we then are hearing about a sort of really literal view of the Book of Mormon or it, the thing I suppose that we would all hear most often now about the about how wonderful the prophets are and how we need to follow their steps and those those are the people who guide us. Right, right. Um, I mean, there is the part of us that would be, can you imagine what it would be like to just say no? <laughs> this is be it. Like that's not what it feels like in my life. Um, how horrible would that be to do that to someone? Because you see, this this space for me, I have so much privilege in it that it has never been. I I, I came I came back to church activity. What would be something like almost almost twenty years ago now. And it was with this new one. So like there was lots of uh, things that were happening around the Mountain Meadows massacre discussions. It was it was sort of really being addressed for the first time. And so I I got to feel like I was experiencing a Mormon history that hadn't quite filtered through to my to people in church yet because they, you know, they weren't hanging around in the internet. This was, you know, these were those early days. Um, yeah. You know, the, the immersion just looked different, whereas I'm sort of seeing it like, well, if I'm going to return to church, I am not here to play at it. I'm going to do this right. So let's let's jump in. Um, so it was, I mean, I was learning, I was reading, I was just consuming books constantly. So um, now while there were things that were maybe uncomfortable that I had to come back to for a little while. I mean, I just, I find church history so fascinating and messy and complicated. And those are the prophets in the scriptures that I was reading as, as a kid, like those messy, complicated guys that, oh my goodness, God can work with that. Then I, sh- I surely he's going to be okay with me. Um, so yeah, I, I really loved the, the Shakespearean conflict, the, the, the drama, the, the, the look at what is possible, the hero's journeys, the, um, the, the, where they totally disagree with each other. I love that because that's th- that's the space that I love to sit in, and everyone can't sit there. It's for some people, I've you know I've had friends who have been in the brink of suicide because this space has been so tough. So while I want to say, "Come on in, the water's lovely here, and it's so great that we can talk about it," I also know that this is going to hurt. That um. If you if you need someone to talk to, I am here, and I will try to be that safe person at church. I will try to be part of that conversation that makes things better. Um, but there are things that I have had to stay not married to. Um, there are. I love the idea. I get really excited by the idea of our potential as people so that even when we you know we go down the road of, of of atheism that if everything was about right now and the kind of life you were living right now and stop speaking to me about eternal perspective because right now it really hurts um or right now is exquisitely beautiful and this is what eternity and th- this is what the celestial kind of i'm getting this celestial moment i get to live in those extremes because I see uh, my my son, um, I, I want to be able to reach in and hold him and fix him and support him through this space. I should be able to do that. He has, he would hurt himself. He would lash out and I can't do that for him. Now, I find comfort in the idea that there is someone who does know exactly what he's experiencing and when I can't do that for him that there is someone who does know um I find that a comforting idea I don't have to hold on to that through my whole life because it just comforts me in that moment and I feel like it's an idea worth holding on to because sometimes 
it's my friend Sarah who gave me that insight or my friend Alana who gave me that insight that when my son is getting so upset because he really wants to hold a baby, but he's so distressed that because he's frightened he might hurt this baby. And so before there is any baby on the horizon, the ones there's no baby around, he's hurting himself because I'm going to hurt a baby. And I have a friend who can tell me what that feels like. And you were that person for me. You, you, you can know that for my son. You, you can reach into that space and explain that for me. And that for me is truly godlike. And so I get to get these incredible glimpses and decide what spirituality looks like for me and decide what religion looks like for me. And I'm privileged to be able to do that and it doesn't work for everyone. And so I think that's why this space, um, my, my friend, uh, our, our co-host Ruth explains it, I think really well, that 21st century saints, what I try to be about is about holding that door open so that if you're going to be in church, you can experience it safely, that you can experience Mormonism the way you need to experience it, um, that you can find Christ there. But that if you're leaving, then I'm holding the door open and then and I can bless you as you take the journey out of that door and that we just sort of try and stay in that space. So, yeah, for me, everything is just that beautiful, messy, complicated. It might look different next week. I have no idea. But that is so exciting. Having choices is the most empowering thing. Retaking your own um, autonomy or ownership of your own spirituality and not um, offloading that onto some octogenarian or nonagenarian. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Jane. This has been a pleasure. I know the audience is going to love hearing both the news that you shared, then also just kind of feeling your your vibe while we chatted today. So thank you so much for, for coming on to Ramium to Ruminations. Thank you so much. I've loved being able to hang out with you. <laughs> we'll have to do it again sometime. Definitely. Thank you so much, Scott. This wrapped up my excellent chat with Jane Christie from the 21st Century Saints. Be sure to go and subscribe to their podcast. Listen to the great work that they're doing over there. They're fantastic ladies and, and it's just a, it's an excellent listen. So be sure to subscribe to them if you're not already doing it. Thanks again, Jane, for sharing your guys' wonderful news with with us over on the Mormon Discussions podcast brand. And I I just want that I want this to get out to as wide of audience as we can as we can push it out to. The news is fantastic and I think hopefully this is signaling an important change within the LDS church. Maybe it's not, maybe this is an, an anomaly, a one-off, but I hope that we can continue pushing this momentum for important changes within the structure of the church. So, wherever you find yourself out there, talking about an awesome movie right after you finished your recording that you wished desperately you would have kept in the recording because it was a fun chat and it might have been fun for the audience to listen to as well. I'm sorry that I wasn't recording it. I wish I could share it with you. But Jane and I both saw the new Spider-Man movie, Across the Spider-Verse, and it's amazing. And we talked about the color palettes and the stylistic changes of the art direction for the different characters. It was a great chat, and I'm sorry that we didn't record it. <laughs> anyway, if that's what you're doing right now, which probably was way too specific and is only applied to Jane and myself right now, regardless, I hope that you have an excellent day. Mm -hmm.